where I want to start, um, and how it was working with uh, Mary Twala, who I believe is actually like um, an icon in South Africa. She's done like so much, so much great work, um, some of which I've seen, most of which I haven't, but she was incredible. And just... So working with Mary was pretty life-changing, to be honest. Like she is, she is an icon in South Africa. Um, and so to get her on board this project was was already quite a, a milestone in itself. Um, but weirdly, like strangely, she she is an icon, but she's never had like a leading role. Um, I stand to be corrected, at least not in film. In theater, I think she's had leading roles, but in film, she's always had sort of a supporting and usually a comedic role. She she was known as a comedian. Um, but she, I, I don't I don't really have like the adequate words to describe Mary. She was just the most incredible human being and so dedicated to her craft. And at the age of 80, you know, there was nothing that she said no to anything we asked her to do. Um, she just went for it and including, you know, riding horses to location because she couldn't physically get there herself and there were no roads, so I couldn't drive her there. Um, I, as the producer, had a lot of anxiety around <laughs> bringing Mary because of how prolific she is. And, you know, I, I'm not someone who prays, but I would literally pray every night like, anything can go wrong but nothing can happen to Mary because if I'm the person responsible for for something happening to Mary I'm going to be crucified when I get back home um so it was it was stressful because she was diabetic um she was also a chain smoker uh so <laughs> she her health wasn't in the best place to to start with and so bringing her into the mountains where there was no infrastructure. I mean, there were no flush toilets. The showers were not really functional. And if they were, they, there wasn't a lot of hot water to go around. Um, and we only had electricity for four hours a day, two hours in the, in the morning and two hours in the evening. And that was just to charge our equipment. It wasn't really for our comfort. So it was a, it was a super rough environment to, to bring an 80 year old woman into um but she really took it in her stride and was she honestly was the heart and soul of of the film but also of the production just everyone absolutely adored her okay and how much um of this film was envisioned on the page how much of how faithful were you guys um to the script or was a lot of it done on location improvised or anything like that. So this was really interesting for me, um, especially me as, as the producer, um, because, you know, I, I might, what, part of my role is to bring order and to bring structure, and that's not how Lemohang works. Um, he came from an experimental background, from a visual arts background, and all of his previous films he made himself. So he had never really, he'd never worked with a crew. He'd never worked with trained actors. Um, and so, I mean, uh, this film was tiny. It was, it was really made with completely limited resources, you know, compared to, to how I would normally work. And I don't work on big budget things. Like every film I've made has been very art house, but this was, was particularly tiny. Our entire crew was 15 people. Um, but for Lemohang, that was massive, you know, and to work with people like Mary was, was a massive deal. Um, so he did, there were some parts that were kind of, we would go with it on the day. And I mean, when I say go with it, I mean more like how it was created, how it was envisioned. In terms of the story and in terms of the dialogue, we were very faithful to the script because Lemohang is a beautiful writer and, and he feels very passionately about his writing, um, particularly his dialogue and, and in this specific film and the narration in particular. 
Um, so we didn't divert very much from that. But in terms of like the bigger crowd scenes where we had, you know, villagers getting involved in things or like the sheep sharing contest, for example, that was just real people enacting what they would do in those situations and us capturing it. But in terms of of Mary and the other, um, sorry, of Manto and the other lead characters in the film, it was it was very uh, faithful to the script. And um, as I understand, and you've mentioned, you work very closely with the community um, on location. And, um, and I just wanted to, to know a little bit more about what they uh, contributed creatively to the, to the project. Yeah, so, um... I mean, the location was really important because we, I knew from a financial standpoint that I had to find a community and a village that worked for the story. Like I didn't have the resources and the, the luxury of money to bring people into a location or to build a set or anything like that. So we had to find a place that felt right. And we were really fortunate that we were able to find that magical place and that the community was really warm to us and, and really supportive of what we wanted to do, even if they didn't really, you know, if they, if they didn't really fully understand what we were doing, they were behind us anyway. Um, and I also cast the film. I cast a lot of the, the material that I produce and I'm super passionate about mixing professional actors with non-actors. And so, um, I mean, the ensemble that you see in the film are real villagers. There were only four trained actors in the film. Um, sorry, three, three sort of professional actors that I brought in from South Africa. Um, and then one or two sort of amateur community theater type actors from Lesotho, but everyone else, um, the kids and so on, were all, were all villagers. And because our crew was so tiny, you know, I needed more manpower. I needed manpower to move my, my equipment around. Like I said, there were no roads. So we were using local people's mules and horses and livestock to move the equipment around. Uh, we were using their homes um, as, as locations in the film. We were using their, you know, their sheep, their dogs, their cows, their cats, um, everyone was kind of involved in front of the camera. Um, and then in terms of just like physically helping us get it made because of how limited our resources were and how small the crew was, like everyone was, was pitching in. And we certainly, we would not have been able to make the film without that community behind us. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the score and the music choices in the film? Sure. So the score is composed by a man named Yu Miyashita. He's Japanese. And um, he and Lemohang had sort of come across each other. They sort of moved in the same circles in Berlin, where they both live. And Yu is actually a noise musician. Uh, so he'd never worked on a film before. This is his first score. Um, but Lemo Hung was kind of certain that this was who he wanted to work with. And um, so it was really about you sort of using his uh, sensibility around, you know, the intricacy of, of noise music. Um, but also his understanding of classical composition and then incorporating Le Siba, which is the, um, the instrument you see the narrator playing in the film. It looks like a long stick, um, incorporating those sounds into the score. And what I think what's quite interesting is that you, so uh, Lemohang edited the film himself and he edited it with me in South Africa. I moved him into my, apartment building so that we were next door to each other and, and that became our edit suite. And um, we literally just communicated with you via WhatsApp or Messenger on Facebook or, you know, this was pre 
pandemic, so Zoom didn't exist. <laughs> if, so if we were lucky, we spoke on, on Skype, but it was all just kind of phone calls and verbal communication um, that resulted in this tremendous score. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm um, got a question here about the production house, Uruku. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So um, we are two producers. We're very small, um, but we're super ambitious. And we're all about telling African stories on African terms. So, you know, there have been a lot of films made on the continent, but um, a lot of times it's people from the West coming in and telling our stories um, from their perspective. And so what we're most interested in is nurturing, you know, authentic, distinct voices and sort of being part of the new wave of African cinema. And uh, over and above the production company, we also co-founded or we founded, I co-founded with my partner, um, an entity called the Realness Institute, which is kind of an incubator for African talent. And one of our flagship programs is a screenwriter's residency, uh, which is Pan-African. And that's where I met Lemohang. So Lemohang was a participant in the residency four years ago and approached me to produce his project which was this is not a burial um after the residency and I was delighted because the material already spoke to me but people coming through the residency have absolutely no obligation to work with us um but it just you know cosmically came together and two years later we were in the mountains shooting the film um but yeah, we're, uh, we work with, with directors that, we work with auteurs mainly. So writer directors that have a really uh, singular distinct voice that are, you know, um, telling stories on their own terms and collectively working with us to challenge the preconceived ideas around African cinema. Um, hi, Kate. Um so my question is, uh, the language spoken in this uh, film, the original language it's filmed in, is Sisu to write? Correct, yeah. Um, so from your perspective, being an Anglophone, as in like you are able to speak and understand English, how much of it do you feel like was lost in translation in terms of like we were experiencing it in predominantly English? Because I don't think anyone in the room actually how much mm -hmm. of, of the original like script or vision do you feel like was lost in translation? It's a great question. Um, I grew up speaking Isizulu, so uh, my sort of um, flair or understanding of, of vernacular languages was not terrible, so I can speak and understand a little bit of, of Sutu, I can understand more than I can speak. It's a very complex language. Um, but I, I mean, Sutu speakers that have watched the film, because it's there's not a lot of films or, or content in general in Sutu language, have said that this is the most beautiful portrayal of their language because it's almost Shakespearean. Like it's a, it's a very sort of pure, version of the language. Um, but I think, I mean, I did the subtitles. So <laughs> um, I, I tried to stay, you know, obviously in, 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 in uh, with Lemohan. Uh, we worked really closely with the, with the post-production, well, I mean, in general, but with post-production as well. And we tried to sort of really capture the beauty of what was being said through the subtitles. But I think with any film, you know, in an indigenous language that you don't necessarily speak, there's always going to be nuances that are that are missed. And frankly, I kind of think that's a beautiful gift to, to audiences that do understand the language, that they get that sort of added layer um, 
they have, you know, they have a bit more access into the beauty of what we created um, compared to the rest of us that are not fluent in the language. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Yeah, what are you working on right now? Uh, what's next for you? So like I said, the reason I look like I haven't slept is because I haven't, because I'm working on a funding application for Lemohang's next film. Uh, we've been pre-selected to the next round of um, the commission for, with the funder. So we're busy hashing out the treatment. I literally got off a call with them a couple of minutes ago. And um, it's super early. It's really in its infancy. So there's not, a, there's not a lot I can say about it, but what I can say is that we're going back to the mountains of Lesotho. That's where the next one is set. And uh, so I'll need to uh, build on my very foundation level Susutu because it will be really cool if for the next one I can be fluent. Um, but yeah, that's with Lemohang, but I have, I mean, in, in Uruku, I also am a head of development and head of production, and I have nine feature films on my slate. So things are, are pretty busy, despite, yeah, the madness in the world at the moment. Yeah, great. Um, and also another question is, um, it, how, with Lemohang, how much um, did he work with the cinematographer? How much? What was their collaboration like um, and how much of what we saw on screen was, was that a shared vision um, or uh, yeah, just to explain that process. Yeah, I think it was a, a very interesting situation for Lemohang because like I said, he, you know, he really worked in isolation before he never worked with a crew. And uh, I think sort of, handing over the camera to someone else was really daunting for him um, but also liberating because he was really just able to to focus on directing and performance and I think it was a a, a wonderful marriage that he had with Pierre it was uh, they really played off each other well and I think that's what Pierre achieved given you know we made this on a grant, like a, a really small grant. And so I wasn't able to bring all the bells and whistles and, and toys in from South Africa. So essentially all the lighting was natural or practical in terms of the, the kerosene lamps, for example, or the candles. Um, we didn't have a lot to play with. And so I think what we achieved, and I think also a huge part of, of the credit of the the beauty of the images is for the production designer as well. I think what, what my team was able to achieve with what we had is, is pretty astounding. Um, and we went in with the goal of, you know, every frame we created, we wanted to look like a painting. We wanted to be able to freeze frame it, print it out and hang it on a wall somewhere. And uh, I'm really proud that I think for the most part we we achieved that. Um, so I, I think yeah, it was a it was tough for Lemohang to sort of relinquish that control of the image, but we were really fortunate with Pierre that it's that it worked. It worked. Yeah, there were definitely there were murmurs of approval there when you said every frame was like a painting. So I think that's that's definitely a good sign. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. And really, it was a, it's a really incredible film. So many congratulations to you and to Lemo Hang. Like, uh, I cannot wait to see what he does next. Um, and yeah, we're really grateful that you shared this with us. Um, and, and You're so us welcome. Well. It's really special to, to share it with people, especially on the continent. So thanks for, for watching and I hope you yeah, I hope it stays with you. It's a really special piece of work and we almost died making it. So it's always great when we get positive feedback because it was really intense to, to put it together. Well, thank you so much, Kate. Thanks guys.
Mm-hmm. <laughs> 